It does not help Mr. Curry out of the mire when he acknowledges in the same place that the determinations of church judicatories, though of general assemblies, are never to be received so far as to give, or excuse me, so as to give the least positive obedience to them, unless they be consonant to God's word and consonant unto it in our esteem. I say this does not help him out of the mire when he adds, quote, Yet unless we are to submit unto them, so as not to act against nor in opposition unto them, I cannot see a hair breadth of difference in the principle of Presbyterians from that which is the principle of independence in this particular, which, Mr. Curry adds, I take to be the main thing in controversy with them, unquote. I shall be far from saying that Mr. Curry has not understood the controversy betwixt Presbyterians and Independents in this particular, but I will venture to say that tis a reproach upon our Presbyterian principles when he affirms that according to the foresaid principles we must submit to church judicatories so as not to act against or in opposition unto them. When this is maintained without the above limitation or restriction, as Mr. Curry does, then tis evident and plain we must be silent, we must not act against them, nor oppose them, though they should bear down the cause of Christ. When it is considered that, in cases, in causes, excuse me, merely private and personal, the sentences of church judicatories are to be submitted unto, though we cannot see the equity of them, it is plain that every man's private judgment is not made the last report. And if Mr. Curry had noticed this, he might have spared his boast of a, quote, farewell all use of church judicatories, except it be for counsel or advice, unquote. But if in the public cause of God, wherein the declarative honor and glory of the Redeemer, and wherein a testimony for Reformation principles once attained unto, are concerned, if, I say, in this case, Mr. Curry is pleased with a silent submission unto the sentence of the Church, when he gives not an active or positive obedience unto them, the cause of truth is betrayed, and a testimony for truth is given up. If Mr. Curry thinks that in the case above mentioned we are so far to submit to the judicatories as not to act against them or in opposition unto them, he cannot but know that if Luther and our reformers had set out upon this principle, if they had not acted against and in opposition unto the sentences of the ecclesiastical courts in their time, the Reformation would have been choked in the bud, and we might to this day have been groaning under anti-Christian tyranny and bondage. I have diverted too long from my present inquiry, which is whether or not Mr. Curry has entered into my argument as I have laid it, concerning the tyranny of the present judicatories and their administration of government and discipline, whereby they have forfeited their claim to one of the characters of a true church given in our reformed confession of faith. And, for proof of this, in the section of the defense above mentioned, I give several particular instances of that tyranny in the administration which takes place in the present judicatories. The first instance I give is... A continued series and tract of violent settlements from above twenty years bypassed, whereby ministers have been intruded upon dissenting and reclaiming congregations, either upon the footing of presentations, or consequence of the act restoring patronages, or upon the footing of the act of Assembly 1732, which, though now repealed, has been put in practice by the judicatories both before and since that time. The present judicatories, by their above conduct and management, exercise a lordly dominion over the heritage of God. They rob and spoil them of their just rights and privileges, and break and scatter them in all corners of the land. I have observed in the defense that Mr. Curry owns that the charge of violent intrusions is what the judicatories can least be vindicated from. But he tells his reader in the essay, page 30, quote, that, as there hath been a considerable struggle made by many ministers of this church against them, a considerable stop hath been put to them for some time by gone. So, whatever ground there is for lamentation, there is no sufficient ground for separation from the Church of Scotland, notwithstanding of such intrusions." Unquote. Upon the first part of his above words, I make the following observations. Defense, page 105 and 106. Quote, it is true that both ministers and many other church members have made a considerable struggle against intrusions, as appeared from the narrative I have given in the introduction. But then, such as are strangers to affairs amongst us in Scotland, and who read the above words of our author, may readily apprehend that the struggles he mentions have been such desirable, have had such desirable success, that the present judicatories are repenting and reforming that course of violence which they have practiced against the Lord's heritage and flock in Scotland. But I appeal to our author himself when he, if he can honestly say that the judicatories are either repenting or reforming their violence. 
whether our author's words may be reckoned an extenuating of the sin of the judicatories, or whether or not, as they are laid, they have an evident tendency to impose upon the world, I leave it to the reader, who knows the state of matters with us in Scotland, to judge for himself." Unquote. Mr. Curry replies to my above reasons in the Vindication, page 109, in the following manner, quote, Mr. Wilson carps because I have said a considerable struggle has been made by many ministers in this church against violent intrusions, unquote. But my words bear no such thing as carping at what he says concerning these struggles. I grant that it is true that considerable struggles have been made. Mr. Curry adds, yet Mr. Wilson asks, what success have they had? But I ask no such question. If Mr. Curry had not perverted my words or shifted the argument, he ought to have told that the question I asked him is whether or not he can honestly say that the judicatories are repenting or reforming the violence. Mr. Curry, according to his usual way of dealing, sets his thumb upon this and palms upon me a question which, in the manner it is reported by Mr. Curry, my words give not the least ground for. If Mr. Curry had spoke to the purpose, he should have told his reader that my words give ground, gave ground for the following question, that is, have the struggles of ministers and many other church members had such desirable success that the present judicatories are repenting and reforming that course of violence they have practiced against the Lord's heritage and flock in Scotland? But it was not the safe for Mr. Curry, but it was not safe for Mr. Curry to state the question after this matter, for he would have had found considerable difficulty in the answering of it. When I tell Mr. Curry that his words a considerable stop hath been put to violent intrusions for some time bygone. If they are not an extenuating of the sin of the judicatories, they have an evident tendency to impose upon the world. Mr. Curry replies that if his words have such a tendency, he has not been singular. For the Reverend Mr. Wilson saith so in his appendix to his sermon, uh, the Reverend Mr. Willison, excuse me, saith so in his appendix to his sermon, 1734. Also, Mr. Ebenezer Erskine, yea, Mr. Wilson himself, though, says he, it seems his memory has failed him. And likewise the brethren in their reasons for not acceding, they all say so. But Mr. Curry is very much mistaken, for none of the brethren he mentions says what he alleges. They indeed acknowledge that the Assembly 1734 did put a stop to the violent proceedings of the former assemblies, but none of them say that a considerable stop has been put for some time bygone, that is, since the year 1733, to violent intrusions. Mr. Curry may know that he published his essay a short time before the meeting of the Assembly, 1738. He also knows that three assemblies intervened betwixt the Assembly, 1734, and the said Assembly. And if Mr. Curry's memory had not failed him, he might have known that I have upon good grounds affirmed that the several assemblies after the year 1734 have returned to the practice of countenancing and supporting violent settlements. And if Mr. Curry will suffer himself to see it, he cannot but know that they continue in the same tyrannical course and practice to this very day. Therefore I speak the truth, and I am very consistent with myself when I tell Mr. Curry that his words have an evident tendency to impose upon the world, or that they may be reckoned in extenuating the sin of the judicatories when he tells his reader that a considerable stop has been put to violent intrusions for some time bygone. If Mr. Curry reckons this a thrust at his character, I wish that for the time to come he may have so much regard to his own character as to be more cautious in his assertions. But when he calls my words a design thrust at his character, I shall leave this amongst the rest of his uncharitable heart judgings. As I reckon intrusions, or the violent settlement of ministers, a high act of tyranny in the administration, so that which I insist upon in my argument is that the present judicatories are not only guilty of tyranny in this matter in one or two particular instances, but that they are guilty of an habitual act, a uh, habitual tract, excuse me, or tyranny over the heritage of God in Scotland in the settlement of ministers for about twenty years past. That the settlement of ministers is an act of tyranny, I prove in the defense, page 107, from Mr. Curry's Just Pop. Uh, div preface page 4 where he gives it as a reformation principle from Calvin and Calderwood that is an impious robbing of the church raping and sacrilege to settle any minister whether the people consent or not upon his, this head Mr. Curry tells me in the vindication page 111 quote 
that he is not as much for the people's rights that he is, excuse me, as much for the people's rights this day as ever, though he cannot see that there is any such tyranny in the Church of Scotland as obliges people to separate from her, unquote. He goes on in the same place to purge the present judicatories of habitual tyranny in this particular instance, quote, For, says Mr. Curry, albeit I own it is to be lamented there have been any violent settlements in the Church of Scotland since the Act Restoring Patronages, yet she is not habitual, habitually guilty of acts of oppression in this matter, unquote. He goes on page 113 and tells his reader, quote, that Mr. Wilson has not cited one sentence from any of his writings from which he can justly infer that our present judicatories are habitually guilty of violent intrusions, unquote. To all which I reply, that I never allege that Mr. Curry calls violent intrusions by the name of tyranny. Neither did I ever allege that he owns that the Church of Scotland is habitually guilty of tyranny in this particular. For I know that he affirms the contrary in his essay as he does in the above words of his present vindication. But that which I say is that if Mr. Curry refuses to own the violent settlements are acts of tyranny, he is inconsistent with himself, or he eats in what he hath, what he had said in his just pop div, that is, that it is impious robbery, raping, or sacrilege to settle a minister whether the people will or not. And what Mr. Curry purges, the present judicatories, and when Mr. Curry, excuse me, purges the present judicatories of habitual tyranny in this manner, it is in vain to deal with such a man by argument or reason. His confident assertion flies in the face of open and manifest fact. Tis as clear as daylight that if violent settlements are impious robbery, sacrilege, and raping, and then uh, that then the present judicatories are habitually guilty in this matter of tyranny in the administration. Mr. Curry may blindfold or amuse strangers who know not our present circumstances in Scotland when he tells them in his books that a considerable stop has been put for some time by gone to violent settlements. And that the present judicatories are not guilty of habitual tyranny in this matter. But I am sure all in Scotland who reckon that the settlement of ministers over dissenting and reclaiming congregations is contrary to the word of God, and that liberty wherewith Christ hath made his people free, such, I say, cannot but judge that the present judicatories are guilty of habitual tyranny and oppression in all the corners of this church and land, and that they are not repenting or uh, that they are not repenting of, excuse me, the wickedness that they have done, nor reforming their violence. Yea, they cannot but judge that it is true what I assert in my defense, that when presbyteries take the patrons or heritors man by the hand, they support, strengthen, and encourage the heritors, the heritors excuse me, in such severities as they have threatened and exercised upon people, when they do not give in to the man whom the heritors think fit to choose for their minister. Though Mr. Curry alleges that it cannot be proven that the judicatories allow, yet when they despise and neglect the people and in opposition to them take the heritors man by the hand and they support and encourage the heritors in such severities and i intend no thrust at mr curry's character when i affirm that his refusing the above noter facts has a tendency not only to impose upon the world but even upon the common sense of mankind mr curry alleges that i am obliged to tell my reader that he is as much for the people's right this day as ever but he must excuse me when I tell him that I do not reckon myself under any such obligation, especially when I consider the observation I have made in the preceding first chapter upon his words in the Vindication, page 113, as also when I consider that he continues to purge the judicatories of habitual tyranny in the violent settlement of ministers. Whatever his former thoughts were, he appears to me to make very little now of the people's right, or in his Jus Populi Divinum, Though Mr. Curry gives not intrusions by the name of tyranny, yet in his reasonings upon this head, he expresses himself in the following manner, quote, I cannot see there is any such tyranny in the Church of Scotland as obliges people to settle, uh, separate from her, unquote. Mr. Curry knows very well how to wrap up himself in ambiguous terms. Therefore, I shall not take it upon me to determine whether his above words do import any acknowledgement that violent settlements are an act of tyranny. Whatever be in this, I think it proper to advertise the reader that though I judge that the present judicatories are tyrannical, yea, guilty of hab habitual tyranny in this respect, yet my argument upon tyranny in the administration is not stated upon this particular only, but upon all the several instances I give in the defense of their tyrannical proceedings.